Are you sure about your salvation? Most people do not have assurance of salvation at all. They don't know the gospel. Uh, they don't know why they need to be saved. But 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 lays out the gospel very clear. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. The Gospel is this. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood, he was buried, and he resurrected. That's the gospel. And it's to be received. Notice Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. You have to receive it. You don't just believe that it happened. You don't just believe that Jesus existed in history. There's all kinds of people that, you know, I've witnessing to people, I say, are you saved? And they'll say, they're not saved, but they do know who Jesus is. They do believe that Jesus died on the cross, that Jesus was uh, real, but they've never received it. You receive it in your heart. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. You receive it. But with this gospel, it says you're saved. In verse 2, by which also ye are saved. And you can't even mention this gospel without mentioning sin. You have to realize the reason you need a Savior is because you're a sinner. He died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again. So, are you sure about your salvation? What is it that's making you sure of your salvation if you are sure? And what's, what is it that's making you unsure of your salvation if you're unsure? I'm going to tell you what should make you sure. Was there a moment when you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? That's what should make you sure. Did that ever happen? You see, the night I got saved, I received Jesus Christ. I received Jesus Christ, the God who I had heard preached about most of my life. I had already knew the gospel. I knew Jesus Christ was real. I knew Jesus Christ was who he said he was. But the night I got saved, I received it. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The night I got saved, I called on the name of the Lord. I said, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died on the cross for me. I know you're buried and resurrected, and I'm putting my faith in you to be saved. My salvation started there. A birth took place there. Just like the Lord told Nicodemus in John 3, 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. A birth took place. 1 Peter 1.23 Being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. That night when I received Jesus Christ, something huge happened. A miracle happened. A birth took place. I was born again. That's what gives me assurance? There was a moment when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now, if I ask you, 
What makes you sure of your salvation? That's what you should say. There was a moment when I believed on Jesus Christ. You see, the night I got saved, a birth took place. You know, somebody says, I, well, I can lose my salvation. You can't lose your salvation. You were born again. If you believed on Jesus Christ, you got born again. You were born into God's family. Just like I can't go back and undo the fact that I was born physically to my mother, you can't go back and change the fact that you were born again spiritually into God's family. That doesn't even make sense. Nothing can change the fact that you got born physically. Somebody would have to go back in time and stop it from happening, which you can't do. You see, the moment you received Jesus Christ, a birth took place. The moment you received Jesus Christ, a circumcision took place, making it impossible for you to lose your salvation. In Colossians 2.10-11, it says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, and whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You see that in verse 11? He circumcised you with the circumcision made without hands. It's made without hands, showing you it's a spiritual circumcision. He put off the body of the sins of the flesh. He cut your soul loose from your flesh. Now when you sin, your sins aren't applied to your soul. They don't touch your soul anymore. They don't contaminate it anymore. And your soul was washed in the blood of Jesus. It's Your soul is perfection, sinless perfection, just like the Lord Jesus Christ because he gave you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So a birth took place, a circumcision took took place that's what happened the moment you received jesus christ and that's why you can be sure about your salvation another thing a sealing took place you were sealed ephesians 4 30 and grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption a sealing took place the, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Nothing can break the seal. A swapping of records took place. He imputed the righteousness of Jesus Christ to me when I got saved. And he took my unrighteousness. And it was paid for. Jesus Christ already paid for my sins on the cross. I just had to accept the payment. And the moment I came to Jesus Christ and received him, I was receiving that payment. I was born again. I was circumcised. I was sealed. I was given imputed righteousness. He gave me his righteousness. He took away my unrighteousness. That's why I'm saved. So are you sure about your salvation? If I come to, up to you and ask you right now, I said, are you sure about your salvation and why are you sure that should be, your answer should be along those lines, that there was a time when you received Jesus Christ. If I come up to you and ask you right now, what's the proof of your salvation? Here's what it cannot be. Here's what it shouldn't be. You should not say, well, look at how I'm living. It can't be how you're living. You know, you hear testimonies in church, and many testimonies will start out with, I know I'm saved because I have a changed life, or because I used to do this, but now I don't anymore, or I used to not do this, but now I do this all the time. I used to not care about the Bible, but now I read the Bible. That should not be what you're looking for as your proof of salvation. You know, somebody might get up and say, I pray, I read my Bible, 
I fast twice in the week. I'm not like this wicked person over here. That should not be your proof of salvation. Because you're always going to find somebody worse than you to look at and say, hey, I'm saved because I'm not like him. I'm doing this and this, and he's not doing that. You see, you can always find somebody that's worse to compare yourself to. That can't be the proof of your salvation. That's a bad, that's a bad answer. So you so if your proof of salvation is how you're living and you get up and say, "Well, I know I'm saved because I'm not doing this or that anymore and because now I'm doing this or that." Well, there's going to come a day What if there comes a day when you're backslid and you're not doing this or this or that anymore? You're not reading your Bible anymore like you was. You're not praying like you was. And maybe a tragedy happens in your life. Uh, you get tired and sick and burnt out. And I'm telling you, there are times when you're so tired and sick and burnt out, it, it makes it really, really hard to live like you're supposed to. What are you going to do then? What's going to be your proof of salvation then? Well, if your proof of salvation was how you're living and you're not doing the good things that you used to do and uh, uh, some of the little bad things that you used to do before you were saved slip back in, what's going to be your reaction? You're going to doubt your salvation. You're going to say, well, I, there's no way I'm saved because I'm doing all this stuff a lost person does. I'm no longer doing those things that I was looking to for the proof of my salvation. You see, that's not a good that's not a good place to look for proof. Having these proofs of salvation will cause you to also put the same expectations and standards on everyone else around you to prove that they are saved as well. You see, you you're saved and you believe the proof of being saved is all these good things that you're doing now. Well, you you get up and you read the Bible and you pray so many times a day, and maybe you witness to 10 people a day, and you got all this, you got this performance that you keep up with and that you perform all the time, and you look to that as your proof, and you look at that as your identity. That's not a good way to be. Not only are, is there's going to come a day when you're not able to do that stuff anymore, a tragedy is going to happen, the devil's going to slip in. He's going to knock you down. You're going to lose your assurance of salvation. But along the way, while you are doing that stuff, you're going to feel so superior to others. And you're going to make them feel like if they're not doing that stuff, then they're not saved themselves. You So you got these proofs of salvation. And it's going to cause you to put these same expectations and standards on everyone else around you to prove that they're safe too. For example, I've heard so many times people say something along the lines of, if you aren't in church every time the doors are open, I doubt you're saved. Or if you don't love coming to church, I doubt you're saved. Things like that. I've, I've heard that so many times, like evangelists, they'll go and say, if you don't love coming to church, I doubt you're saved. And I'm thinking... What reality are you, you, you out of touch with reality? This guy's living in some fantasy. Just because he loves coming to church every time the doors is open and never goes through times where he doesn't love coming to church, he's in some crazy fantasy land where he thinks everybody in the, in the pews loves coming to church too. But there's people who go through Complete hell. Complete hell. Just to get to church. And if you had the situation that they were in, you wouldn't want to come to church. I doubt you would even be in church. Most likely. You know, you got some people 
Like, I know this one guy, uh, his, his wife gives him complete hell about going to church. Uh, he's raising his grandkids. Um, it's really hard for him to come to church. And, you know, you, you, you go through that for years and years and you put up with that for years and years of the devil just beating you up about going and you, you, it's easy to get bitter about it and even resent it. You're not going to, that person's not going to necessarily love going to church, you see. And you're putting all these standards on people to, for them to have this proof of salvation that you've got. And half of these proofs that you've got for salvation aren't even in the Bible. I've heard people say, well, stuff, uh, just get up and just beat people up about coming to Sunday school. And I'm just like, I, I mean, I teach the Sunday school. I'm never going to get up and say, you're not right with God. You're not coming to Sunday school. Sunday school's not even in the Bible. How can I get up and say and tell the people in my Sunday school class, you're not right with God because you missed last week. I'm not going to spend five minutes harping about not about them not being at Sunday school. I'm going to give them something from the Bible that's hopefully going to make them want to come back. There is 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And they've all got at least three applications to each verse. There's plenty to teach on other than you should have been to Sunday school last week. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. Just crazy. It's crazy what people want to harp about and then use that as you're not saved if you're not doing this or this or that. You didn't really get saved if you don't, if you're like this. Quit putting your standards on people. Those are your own personal convictions. Not only are you going to make yourself eventually doubt your salvation, you're going to have them doubt in their salvation over their own works. So I don't make the standards. God made the standards, and the standard of being saved is the only, the only condition is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If I make the standards... There would always be someone with higher standards. If if we make the standards for salvation, there's always going to be somebody with higher standards. Who could then deem you as lost? You know, maybe you got really high standards and you can look down at me and say, I doubt you're saved because you don't do this or this or that or you do this or this or that. Well, there's going to be this guy across town over here and he lives a little bit holier than you, and he can look at you and say, you're doing that. I doubt, I seriously doubt that you got saved, man. I seriously doubt you're saved because you do that or because you don't do this. I doubt that you really got it. There's always going to, you know that saying, there's always somebody bigger. And, you know, you got this guy over here, and he, he can beat up this guy. He can beat up everybody. But then he goes to this other town. And their big guy in that town beats him up. But then that guy goes to this other town and he gets beat up. You see, there's always somebody bigger. Well, there's always somebody living more righteous than you. And then even the most righteous man can't live up to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, there's just like there's always somebody bigger, there's always going to be somebody more holy than you. So it, it can't be about what you're doing and what you're not doing. There are lost men who act better than some saved men. There are some lost men that I can stand to be around and some saved men I know that I can't stand to be around. It has to go back to, was there a moment when you believed on Jesus Christ? What are you looking for for the proof of your salvation? It can't be, well, I read my Bible. I fast twice in the week. I'm not like this horrible person over here. That can't be your answer. The answer must be, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was going to hell. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the proof of your salvation. 
And because when it comes right down to it, you're not that good. I don't care if you everybody thinks that you are just the greatest thing ever and that you're the most spiritual thing ever. You ain't that good. You are a wretch. You really underestimate your flesh. You think that you're so good and that's a sin because you think that you're all that. You ain't nothing. You, it, you should be in hell right now. And the only reason you're not in hell is because the righteousness of Jesus Christ is on you because you got born again, because you got spiritually circumcised, because you're sealed into the day of redemption, because the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses you from all sin. That's the only reason that you're saved. It ain't because you are something. If a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself, and you are deceived. And Paul said in Romans 7, 18, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. There ain't nothing good about your flesh. You need to quit walking around like it's all that, because that's just nasty for you to do that. He says, For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. See, he's got a battle going on. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. You see, he's got two natures. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. It's the inward man, you see, that loves the Bible. It's the inward man that wants to do right. This flesh is filth. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am. He said, O oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This is a horrible, filthy body. There ain't nothing good about your body. The stuff you're doing in it does not make you saved. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul was honest about it. He said in Philippians 3.21, Our vile body shall be fashioned like unto his glorious body. You are in a vile body, and the stuff you're doing in it cannot get you salvation. You still sin. You ain't that good. I don't know why you think you're so good, but you're not. 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You may admit that you still sin. You know, there's a lot of people that admit, well, yeah, I still sin. But do they, do they do? I don't really think that they believe that. I think that they think they're sinless. I think that they think that they have arrived and they're saying that to look humble. But I don't think, I don't really believe that they think they ever do anything wrong. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive us our sins and cleanse from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You're not that good. You sin, and you do it all the time. Everybody listening to this has a sinful lifestyle. Just because you don't commit adultery and smoke pot and shack up does not mean you're not a sinner. You do something wicked every day. You have a sinful thought every day. You need a daily confession of sins for that reason. So quit acting like this guy over here has got a sinful lifestyle because he's not. he's got a sin that you don't have. And then you make him feel like he's lost because he's not doing everything that you're doing and is not abstaining from everything you're abstaining from. You still have a sinful lifestyle. Even if it isn't apparent or as gross as someone else. You know, a, a, an habitual gossip is just as much a sinner, is just as much a sinful lifestyle as a somebody who drinks all the time. You know, Proverbs 24, 9 says, the thought of foolishness is sin. Proverbs 20, uh, 19 says, he that goeth about as a tell-bearer revealeth secrets. You're going about as a tell-bearer all the time. Or James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So what are you looking to? What are you looking to as a proof of your salvation? It should not be, 
Well, I fast twice in a week. I read my Bible every day. I'm not like this guy over here. That shouldn't be your proof of salvation. The proof of your salvation is, was there a time you came to Jesus Christ, you knew you were a sinner on your way to hell, and you said, I want to be saved. I, I know I'm a sinner. It ain't about words that you say. It ain't about what you do. It's did you come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believe from the heart to salvation? With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made to salvation. You know, the night I got saved, I, just, I got down on my knees and I said, Jesus Christ, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm going to hell. But I know you died for me. And I want to be saved. And before the words even came out, I had already believed in my heart to salvation. I received it. And from that time on, I've been saved through the good times and through the sinful times.